So thank you for that. I'm, I hope I'll be as interesting as the people who've just spoken, although I doubt I'm as good looking. Um, but I was asked to come and, and give a presentation about what's happening in technology and what will happen next. Um, and I thought it was kind of useful to think about three kinds of conversation that, that happen in technology today. Because um, if we'd been having these kind of conversations maybe five years ago, we'd mostly have been talking about smartphones. Everything was smartphones. That was really the only interesting question. Whereas now we have kind of three different questions. There are people in technology who spend most of their time thinking about what will happen in 2025 or what will happen in 2030, um, which mostly means Web3 and crypto. And then most of the actual technology companies are building things based on ideas from five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, ideas like cloud and machine learning. And then the rest of the economy is being overturned by ideas from the 2000s, from 2000, 2005, maybe even 1995. Kind of wild, crazy ideas like maybe people will buy stuff online, or maybe people will buy stuff on the internet, or watch streaming TV on the internet. Um, so I'll kind of talk about each of those in turn. Firstly, um, the things that people are excited about for 2030, there's really two sets of conversations. There's um, Web3 and Metaverse, which are the things where everyone jumps up and down and shouts. And then there are all the other interesting things, which are generally kind of deeper and narrower and not so much kind of general universal platforms that you might use to build software. Um, but Web3 and Metaverse are both sort of ideas of how you could build software across everything. Um, and in a sense, these terms are both sort of rebranding. Um, so Web3 is an attempt to say that cryptocurrencies aren't just about money, they are new models for building software. And Metaverse is an attempt to say that VR isn't just about games and headsets, instead this might be the next universal platform or the next universal device after smartphones. Um, and if I talk first of these about Web3, um, I've always kind of liked this, this quote from Voltaire, who said that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And there's kind of the same problem talking about cryptocurrency. It's not cryptography, it's not really currency, it's not a database, it's not blockchain, it's all sorts of different things. So what do you call it? How do you think about what this would be? Um, and Web3 is kind of an attempt to say, well, this is about building a computer system and a different kind of computer system, a different way of building internet software. And so the original web, um, all of us and all of our companies created content and published it. But Web 2.0 in the 2000s was this idea that the users would create content and that would then be placed inside networks, whether that was Facebook um, or YouTube, but also things like Yelp or TripAdvisor. The value comes from the content from the users and the user's content is then placed in a network. Um, but of course, the companies still control it. And so the idea of Web3 is that if you were to build these systems on a blockchain, then all of the users would have the kind of control and also a share of the value in ways that they don't have in a Web2 network. Um, this is also very much kind of an open, a second coming of open source. Um, in the, the original open source was this wild, crazy idea that you might write software in an open, distributed way. Um, and that took over the tech industry, but it mostly runs inside big companies. Whereas a blockchain is an open source computer that's open source as it runs. So everybody can see the code. Everybody can see how it's happening. Um, and so this has become a very religious, very kind of messianic vision for how technology would work. Um, we go from closed, centralized um, systems where companies make money and we have lots of problems to a wonderful new open, decentralized world where the users make money. Um, and of course, we have probably repl replicate all the old problems, but in exciting new ways. Um, this gets people very excited. It gets a lot of people speculating in the future value of these things. Um, I should probably update this chart because these numbers have all halved since the last time I made it. Um, there's a little bit of volatility here. Um, but if you dig into some of those applications, you have people very interested um, outside of te the technology world in things like Bitcoin as a store of value. And you have people experimenting with things like NFTs as ways of taking ideas of sort of self-expression and identity and turning them into digital property. Um, still, frankly, very early, um, but a lot, an awful lot of interest coming from brands. This is Alex Arnaud, Bernard Arnaud's son. Um, who runs um, LVMH, experimenting with NFTs in Tiffany and in the luxury goods industry. 
And so we have some big numbers. Um, again, these are um, nominal value traded on OpenSea, the, the biggest NFT exchange, maybe $5 billion of value traded in January, but only about 500,000 actual accounts and probably only 50,000 actual people engaging with this yet. And you kind of see that picture across a lot of these systems that once you start moving away from people who are buying and selling Bitcoin and look at um, actual software use cases and people building and using things that might become software on a blockchain, you have hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people who are kind of actively engaged with this stuff. Um, so this is relatively early. Um, another kind of interesting example of things that you can do with this is you, one picks up that software theme is Helium, which builds a distributed um, wireless access network and connects them together and then pay, creates incentives for people to deploy them using a blockchain. And so another example of a decentralized incentive system, a decentralized computing system. Um, now, I think if one steps back and looks at this, it reminds one of very much of the early internet, or indeed of early open source, in that it's still very early, very technical, nothing works, everything is fragmented and complicated. There is a huge amount of creative energy, a huge amount of effort and work and kind of intellectual interest going into this, also a huge amount of uncertainty as to what it might look like in the future. And I think it's really interesting, as I've mentioned open source a couple of times, to think about where we are with open source today. Um, the iPhone, open source took over the tech industry, the iPhone is full of open source, um, and yet the iPhone is closed. And yet, it's a closed system that has millions of apps and billions of downloads, so what exactly does closed mean? I think the same kind of question applies as one thinks about what decentralized or blockchain systems might look like in five or ten years' time. Um, it's not so much a question of whether this will happen as where and how and at what layers of the stack. Where do the centralizing and decentralizing layers come? Where are the aggregators and gatekeepers? Where do the network effects apply? What happens when the religion of decentralization um, meets kind of reality of deploying consumer products? There are kind of similar questions, I think, if one thinks about metaverse, um, which I think if you say metaverse three times, then a PwC consultant appears in the corner um, in a puff of smoke. Um, but metaverse is actually a much simpler thesis. It's, excuse me, it's a thesis that VR and AR become the next universal device after smartphones, that they become about much more than games. Games also become much bigger. And so everybody is using a VR or head AR device all the time, every day, the way we use smartphones all the time, every day. And so they become about much more than sort of just computing. They become about self-expression and identity and popular culture. Um, this all sounds very good. It's also very vague, frankly, and it reminds me a lot of the way we talked about um, something called the information superhighway in the early 90s. People said, well, maybe everybody's going to have a computer. And if everyone had a computer and it was connected to a network, what would that mean? And then you write a bunch of words on a whiteboard and you call it information superhighway and you think it'll get built by Bertelsmann and Deutsche Telekom and AT&T and Walt Disney Company. Metaverse is kind of the same. You get a whiteboard, make a list of everything cool that you think will happen on the internet in the next 10 years, and then draw a box around it and call it metaverse. Well, yes, most of those things will happen. Most of the things that we talked about in the early 90s happened, but not necessarily like that. Um, if one steps back, meanwhile, and asks where we are with VR today, we're still very early. Meta has now sold probably 15 million headsets, um, which is not nothing, and they have a spike every Christmas, which is both good and bad, because it tells you it's a Christmas present rather than kind of a mainstream experience. Um, it's also, on the other hand, much smaller than something like Roblox, for example, and so it's still kind of an early stage of development. It's still right at the beginning of the S-curve, where mobile was in the mid where smartphones were in the mid-2000s. The question for the next 10 years, I think, is you know, Moore's law will give us better devices, engineering will give us better devices, but who will care? And it's kind of interesting to compare and contrast what happened with smartphones with what's happened with games consoles. So Moore's law took smartphones from black and white Nokias to the iPhone to the things we have today. It also took games consoles from the Nintendo to the PlayStation 5, but that's not a mass market experience. Only about 200 million people have a games console. Um, it's not the 5 billion people that have a smartphone. And so this is kind of the question for VR. Um, does this become a universal experience that everyone will want if we just throw 10 years of Moore's Law at it, or will it remain a kind of a deep and narrow experience where most people look at it and say, that's very pretty, and then kind of walk past? Um, 
this, I think, kind of gets us to the kind of pulling both of those threads together, thinking about where we might be in 2030. We have this sort of very deterministic thesis. This is amazing. It must be part of the future. Um, well, yes, but what kind of part of the future? Um, the internet and the web were open source, um, and open source were amazing and part of the future, but also things like drones or 3D printing, which turned out not to be mass market experiences at all. Um, also worth remembering that the future can take a very long time. It took kind of 15 years from when we started talking about the mobile internet for the sales to really take off. Um, and you can have kind of a winter or two on the way. People got very excited about VR and AR um, back in the 1990s, and then we kind of had to forget about them for 20 years before anything happened. And then kind of a, sort of a final observation here, and this is a diagram of the internet from 1995, um, except it's not called the internet, it's called cyberspace because there were lots of different networks and it wasn't clear the internet would be the only one. Within the internet, it was not clear that the web would be the only application. And then within the web, it was not really clear how that was going to work either. And as we talk today about what we might do on the metaverse or what we might do with crypto and Web3, it's worth kind of remembering that like, nobody had a clue what the internet was going to be. Nobody had a clue how mobile was going to work. Nobody had a clue how smartphones were going to work. We kind of knew in general terms everybody's going to do this, but we really didn't know um, what the structures would be and where the gatekeepers would come from. And I think that the same applies today. Meanwhile, the rest of the tech industry gets on with deploying ideas from sort of the last five and ten years. Um, we talk about Metaverse and Web3, and then we deploy all the great ideas we kind of already had. Um, and I think the best way to express that is this kind of horrible phrase, digital transformation, which kind of sounds like a parody of marketing bullshit, but, but what it actually means is that in the 70s, every big company got a mainframe, and in the 90s, they moved to PCs, and now they moved to the cloud. And so this is kind of a generational shift in how um, computing works, in how software gets built. Um, if you're in the tech industry, this feels kind of old and boring, like cloud is an old story from 10 years ago. Why are we talking about this? Except it's actually still very early, and the process of moving um, enterprises to the cloud has only just started. And in fact, the old stuff can hang around for a very long time. This is IBM's install base of mainframes, which is in fact still growing, even though most people in this room weren't born the last time anybody actually thought about mainframes. Um, but as you go through that transition, it's not just that you go from buying your boxes from IBM to Sun to Microsoft and back again. You change what the software is, and you change how much it is. So you go from one application on a mainframe to dozens with on-prem to hundreds of applications when we go to, um, to the cloud. Um, it's just an illustration of that from Okta. Big companies today have 50, 100, 150 different applications. Um, even individual teams have 50 to 75 different applications just within one department of a company. And so you've kind of got this explosion in the amount of software that, that, that we're creating and the companies are being founded to create. This is kind of one illustration of this. This is Vodafone from a couple of years ago. They have 2.6 million invoices every year. What would you do with that if you were building software today to change that? How would you automate that? What would machine learning do to that? Um, and another illustration, this is a company called Frame.io, which helps people collaborate on professional video. And so what they do is unbundle a spreadsheet full of time codes and email threads and Dropbox links and private Vimeos into one piece of software that pulls all of those applications, all of those tools together. And so today we have sort of hundreds and hundreds of companies that are basically unbundling email and unbundling Excel and aiming to be one of those hundreds and hundreds of applications that are deployed inside every big company. And that's being built on top of platforms like SaaS and cloud with building blocks and ideas around machine learning, and networks and marketplaces. And so this is just a sort of a Cambrian explosion of the amount of software companies being created today. Um, Meanwhile, the rest of the economy um, is being messed up by ideas from sort of 2000. Um, and I think the best way to express that is the idea that basically everything the internet did to music or newspapers is now happening to everybody else. Um, this is kind of an illustration of that. This is the decline from peak in the USA of um, newspaper ad revenue, bookstore revenue, physical bookstore revenue, I should say, and then um, pay TV. And you know, people in the TV business were not looking at the book industry or the music industry and thinking that's going to happen to us. They thought it was a completely different industry. Today, there's a lot of people in, say, banking who do not think they have lessons to learn from what happened to newspapers. And they say, what is this disruption thing exactly? Um, this, incidentally, is what's been happening to retail itself, which is a much slower process, but then also a much bigger industry. 
So as you go through this process, you have this sort of fundamental unbundling. All of the old value chains that were based on gatekeeping and physical assets break apart. Um, you have new models, new entrants, new gatekeepers. This is a very obvious observation. You could have made this slide in 1995 or so if you, if you worked at McKinsey then. It's just the question is, when does it happen to which industries? This is what's been happening to TV. Um, pay TV subscription in the USA um, went up all the way through the first internet boom, but has now just started collapsing about five years ago and is down by about a third from the peak, from about 80% now to about 50% penetration. Um, this is a great quote from 10 years ago before this started happening. Um, the chief executive of Time Warner was asked if he was worried about Netflix, and he said worrying about Netflix was like worrying about the Albanian army. Um, that was not a great prediction in hindsight, um, especially given that Netflix has a bigger production budget than Warner today, um, as does Amazon. Um, and both Netflix and Amazon now spend more commissioning original content than every broadcaster in the top five European markets combined. So more than every broadcaster in the UK, France, Germany, Spain, and Italy combined. Um, that's what this looks like in the UK. Um, UK 16 to 34s now watch more TV subscription video, so basically more Netflix and Amazon than all content on, the top, on all UK broadcasters combined. So you have a bunch of companies here that went from being big fish in a small pond to being small fish in a global pond with all the kind of basis of competition shifting around. Um, that in turn means that the TV set has become a battleground. People always forget that Apple announced the Apple TV at the same event that they announced the iPhone. Um, technology basically completely failed to have an impact on TV for 10 years, um, but now the TV, TV set has become a battleground. Um, and then, of course, there's the retail industry. Um, this is a chart just for the US and the UK because the data is available. Um, the UK had a big lockdown and so had a big surge in the pandemic. Um, the UK, sorry, the US had a smaller lockdown, a smaller surge, but in both of these now, this is sort of e commerce is 20 to 30 percent of total retail. Um, this is sort of unevenly distributed. So this is the picture if we look across Europe. Um, over 80% of people in the UK made an online purchase in the last three months. Um, only about 30% of Italians. Um, so there's a kind of a very wide spread in how much people are doing this, but the direction of travel for all of them, I think, is exactly the same. Um, if I go back, though, and dig into that data in the UK, what I've done here is split e-commerce penetration by, by grocery and non-grocery, food and non-food. So stuff where you need to collect it from the store or you need a refrigerated truck to bring it to your home versus stuff that can come through the mail. And the stuff that can come through the mail, everything except food, is now at 40%. So 40% of UK retail is now online. And that's kind of pretty profound consequences for everything from brand building to advertising to, of course, real estate and property taxes. Um, Amazon, of course, has built its own logistics chain on the back of that. So it's now bigger than FedEx in the USA and says that it will be bigger than FedEx and UPS combined. So basically the same size as the US post office in the course of 2022. Um, Amazon's revenue, or rather the, 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 the value of goods sold on Amazon has now passed Walmart. So companies become bigger than the previous retail leader. Um, and it's using that scale to build all kinds of new and interesting models. So most obviously, Amazon now has an advertising business. Last year, Amazon did about $31 billion of advertising revenue, um, which means that Amazon is roughly the same size as Google Display, slightly bigger than YouTube, slightly more advertising revenue than the entire global newspaper industry, coming from basically nowhere five years ago. Another kind of unconventional competitor I think is really interesting is Shopify. Shopify, which we have an ad for at the back somewhere, did $175 billion of GMV last year, $175 billion of products sold on the platform by its merchants. Um, and that makes it roughly 45% of the size of Amazon Marketplace. So this is kind of one of Amazon's biggest competitors that isn't a consumer-facing brand, comes from Canada, nobody had really heard of five years ago. And then one more example of an unconventional competitor is, is Apple, which doesn't really have an ad business, but decided to become a power player in the advertising industry by changing the definitions, changing how the data worked. Um, of course, as you go through these changes, um, you change what people buy, you change what the brands are, you, change, you remake everything else around the channel. Because when you change a channel, people don't buy the same things, but on a new channel, they buy different things in different ways. They buy different things online. Um, the brands themselves, of course, are all having to go online now. I think if we'd been here 20 years ago and said, what's the category that will never go online, we would probably have put makeup at the top of the list. But L'Oreal now has over a quarter of its sales going through online channels. And then we have entirely new kinds of brands breaking in. So this is Google Trends for Shein, Chinese smartphone-only fast fashion brand, against Zara and H&M. 
This is their mind share in the USA. It's now the second most popular shopping app after Amazon for American, American teenagers. And on credit card data, it's now bigger than Zara and H&M combined. This is now the biggest fast fashion brand in the USA, um, coming from basically nowhere five years ago. Um, and there's a bunch of interesting things about the model. Part of it is fast fashion and on steroids, five to 10,000 new SKUs every day, predictive ordering, short run manufacturing, maybe only buying 100 units um, at a time. But the other side is instead of building 1,000 stores and having to wait to build 1,000 stores, um, all the money goes on advertising. And so this is, I think, a much more general and much more important point, that for any brand, any marketer, any advertiser, anyone touching a consumer, there are always kind of two fundamental questions. There's a logistics question and a discovery question. Um, what, how do I get it, and how would I know what I want? And in the past, there were a whole bunch of different budgets that were all kind of separate. So you wouldn't say, should I open a store in that country or just advertise there? But now those all become one budget. So the advertising, the marketing, the rent, the returns, the shipping, those all become one question around how you touch your customer. If you open more stores in that area, do your returns go down? What happens to your CAC? What happens to the LTV? Should you put the money on Instagram or on cheaper shipping? Those all become kind of interchangeable. And in this context, it was really interesting a couple of weeks ago that Unilever said they will no longer have a CMO. Instead, the CMO will cover both marketing and advertising and direct sales to consumers. So if I pull some of these threads together um, with a conclusion, there's an awful lot of stuff that I haven't talked about here. This is a framework for everything that's happening in tech. And there's a lot of other stuff happening in tech as well, um, from regulation to privacy to whatever China does, advertising, all sorts of other questions. But I wanted to just go back and talk about the first industry that got messed up by the tech industry, which is music. And so this is the decline and fall of recorded music industry revenue, um, still, now, still down from the peak in 1999, but has been growing since about 2014, um, driven into, almost entirely driven by streaming. Um, but if we look at that number there, that's about $25 billion of, 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 of revenue last year, and compare that to some other things in the tech industry. Well, it turns out Netflix alone is bigger than the entire recorded music industry. But then if you take Amazon's App Store Commission, sorry, Apple's App Store Commission, and the money that Google pays Apple to be the default search engine, those little bits of rent that Apple has at the side of its business are bigger than the recorded music business and bigger than Netflix. Um, Amazon's advertising business, incidentally, is also bigger than Netflix and bigger than the entire music industry. So there's a difference of scale here. Apple's total revenue, of course, was about $400 billion, so 10 times the numbers that are shown on this chart. And the kind of observation I would make here is that what we've seen in the last 20 years is that the tech industry builds things. It builds broadband or smartphones or streaming or the web or search engines, and those break apart lots of other businesses or change the whole basis of competition, change the rules, change the railroad tracks for how other industries work. But the tech industry isn't interested in those questions, it's interested in moving on to the next thing. Nobody in the tech industry today is thinking about music or books, they're thinking about quantum and Web3 and VR and satellites. And so if we think about the last time we went through one of these sort of fundamental transformations in the technology that, that we live by, I think it's really interesting to look at the car industry. And the first 50 years of the car industry was what's a car, what's a car company, who builds cars, who has them, what happens? The second 50 years was, well, what happens when everybody has a car? And so this picture here is from the front cover of the Sears Roebuck Annual Report from 1960, which I think is hilarious because we look at this and we see a kind of a wasteland of parking lots and a shopping mall and freeways and just concrete everywhere, although there's quite a nice sunset. Um, but this was commissioned by Sears Roebuck because they thought this was fantastic and they wanted to show everyone what a wonderful, bright future they were building. The irony, of course, is that Walmart then came along and crushed them. But none of that was built by the car industry. I think the same thing is now happening in tech, that the last, five year, last 50 years of the tech industry was what's a computer? What's a computer company? What's software? Who's going to have a computer? Why would we do have that? How does this work? And the answer was a smartphone and everybody on Earth, and everyone on Earth has a smartphone now. And the next question in the next 50 years is, well, what happens with that? What companies do we build now that everybody has a computer? And with that, I will say thank you. <laughs>